tonight, the first debate. But not all the leaders take the stage. I think, I, think I, come. Here. I think I found some consensus. A first look at the challengers, fact-checking a liberal promise, and Rosemary with the Ad Issue panel. Some call it an impeachment investigation. In the U.S., a baby step towards impeachment here. Fears about vaping. They just taste good. The evidence is mounting. Is Canada keeping up? And she won Olympic gold twice for Canada, even carried the flag. So why does Kaylee Humphreys want to compete for the United States? This is The National. It is a day of firsts in this federal election campaign. The first debate tonight after the first full day of campaigning. From the West Coast to Ontario, the main party leaders were out shaking hands, holding photo ops, and dodging curveballs. We'll head to our reporters on the campaign trail in just a moment. But Rosie, we start with most of the leaders in attack mode tonight. Yeah, we'll take you through all of that, Andrew. But at this first debate, much of the focus was really on who didn't show up. And that was Justin Trudeau, who opted to stay out on the trail today. For those who did attend, this is the image they would like you to remember, that empty podium. But as Salima Shifty explains, the Liberals think they have a strategy for that. Hey, man. Hey. Good to see you. Nice to you. you okay? Yeah. After a couple of quick campaign stops in the early morning, three party leaders hunkered down for more last-minute prep waiting to hit this stage. We know that with tax cuts, Mr. Scheer's tax cuts, what they need is tax cuts for the wealthiest. Mr. Scheer and the Green Party have the same target for balanced budgets. Elizabeth May, the experienced debater. Andrew Scheer, aiming to look calm and in charge. Jagmeet Singh, who spent weeks preparing. I believe it has to be different, and we can do it differently. All focused on one glaring absence. I think we can all agree that Justin Trudeau is afraid of his record, and that's why he's not here tonight. He has made yeah, life more expensive than we'll we'll well, we can agree well, on I'm that. Glad we... Justin Trudeau sitting this one out was a prime target well before the debate started. Mr. Trudeau hasn't shown up for four years, and he's not showing up to this debate. Uh, if I were him, I'd be afraid of showing up as well. It's too bad, but I think Canadians will read into, into that a prime minister who's afraid of his own record. But will they? Trudeau is banking on no. Choosing to play offense, three stops and three ridings he's hoping his party can steal. Taking advantage to announce more help for first time home buyers in cities where the market is hot. Owning a house should be a realistic life goal. Staying away is also strategic caution, some say. Trudeau knows he could be attacked, and the Liberals want to protect their leader a little bit. When pressed, Trudeau pointedly mentioned the debates he's agreed to attend, two official ones and an extra in French. Very happy to be continuing to talk with Canadians, and of course, I look forward to the opportunity uh, to debate against uh, my fellow leaders uh, in the three occasions that we'll be, uh, we'll be doing in this campaign. And that's what Trudeau's betting on, that voters aren't yet paying that much attention and will forget about this one, hoping that skipping this first debate won't be interpreted as if he's afraid of the scrutiny. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. So back to those campaign stops. What were they all about today? We have reporters traveling with Trudeau, Sheer, and Singh. I'm Katie Simpson in downtown Toronto. Conservative leader Andrew Sheer wanted to spend his day attacking Justin Trudeau for skipping tonight's debate. Instead, he was on the defensive, knocked off message by a strategic attack from the Liberals. Sheer had a photo op with his candidate running in the Toronto riding of York Centre. About an hour before the event, the Liberals tweeted a video from 2017 of that candidate excitedly advocating for the anti-abortion movement. Sheer was forced again to state he would not reopen the abortion debate. And his candidate, Rachel Wilson, had to distance herself from the comments, though she wouldn't directly answer the question of whether she might bring forward an abortion bill if she wins. I'm Hannah Thibodeau, also in Toronto, but covering the NDP. Jagmeet Singh started day two in nearby Brampton. All five ridings in that area currently held by the Liberals, but Singh is hoping to make inroads. It's an area he has roots in personally and professionally as a former MPP. At a newser behind Singh, a row of people symbolizing Canadians waiting in line for health care services. And he said if he becomes PM, he'd try to build a new hospital in Brampton. Although he did admit it could be a difficult task since hospitals are a provincial jurisdiction and he would be dealing with Conservative Premier Doug Ford. 
he reiterated he would provide prescription drug coverage for all Canadians by next year and would be willing to look at expanding their criteria for people waiting to access doctor-assisted dying. I'm David Cochran with the Liberal campaign in Edmonton, where Justin Trudeau is going to have to work hard to hold on to the MPs he has in the face of rising voter anger here in Alberta. But this rally is being held in an Alberta riding that the Liberals do not hold that they think they can win. It's Edmonton Strathcona, an NDP seat right now, but the incumbent MP isn't running again. Now, Trudeau started his day one province over on Vancouver Island with a promise to make it easier for people to buy their first homes in expensive real estate markets like Vancouver Island, Vancouver, and the greater Toronto area. Those aren't just hot real estate markets, they're also key battlegrounds in an election that's all about the cost of living. Trudeau's plan to expand the first-time home buyer incentive program so that people with bigger mortgages can qualify too. He also announced a plan today to deal with speculation by foreign buyers that's driving up prices in some markets. Through the campaign, CBC News will look at claims by leaders made on the trail. And Evan Dyer starts with this one. We will also introduce a modest 1% annual tax on residential properties owned by people who are not Canadian and do not live in Canada. We have seen from British Columbia's example uh, that uh, even a modest tax can have a significant uh, impact on speculation, uh, foreign speculation in housing markets. Justin Trudeau chose BC, Canada's tightest housing market, to make his announcement on a new tax aimed at foreign speculators. It's also the place that road tested a similar tax starting last year and, as luck would have it, gave its first progress report today. The tax is working as we intended. It is, in fact, targeting speculators, people living outside of British Columbia, and it's also helping to encourage homes to be used to house people. BC says it's collecting more money from the tax than it expected to. More importantly, BC calculates the tax caused a drop in average house prices of more than 5.5%. But not everyone is convinced that something similar should happen everywhere in Canada. Uh, we would want to take a look at uh, how the regions would be affected uh, coast to coast. Um, before we could come out and say one way or the other whether this will create more supply. Not every market is red hot like Vancouver or Toronto. There aren't many foreign speculators looking to buy in Moncton or in Saskatoon, so this measure wouldn't have much impact there. But in markets that are overheated, BC's experience shows that this model can put the brakes on rising house prices and even roll them back. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. So, already day two, but we got lots to talk about with that issue tonight. Chantal, Andrew, and Althea, join me in about 15 minutes. We'll talk through that first day of campaign from start to finish, but a whole lot, too, about that debate tonight. First, though, back to Adrian with an exclusive story. All right, so, Rosie, Canada is losing an Olympian. You cannot talk about the Winter Games without talking about Kaylee Humphreys. The two-time gold medalist was the face of Canadian bobsleigh, but tonight we've learned she is leaving to represent the United States. Devin Haru spoke with her and she tells us why. I just felt my environment wasn't safe um, for me to be in. Kaylee Humphreys tells us in a CBC News exclusive she no longer feels safe competing for Canada. She's asked to be released from the team, but Humphrey says bobsleigh Canada won't do it. So now she's suing. In court documents obtained by CBC News tonight, Humphreys alleges the organization breached their contract relating to their athlete coach code of conduct. Humphreys filed a harassment complaint last August. She's been waiting for resolution, but has lost patience. There has been no information provided throughout this past year on how I can return to sport. I've asked time and time again what I need to do. Um, what would be a safe environment? I would like to come back to a safe environment, be competing for Canada. 1,200s on the last run. Humphreys is a three-time Olympic medalist and the only female bobsledder to win back-to-back -back gold medals. So accomplished, she was a closing ceremony flag bearer at the Sochi Olympics. Heartbroken about leaving the country she's accomplished so much for. Um, it's really hard. <laughs> it's hard. Um, this has been, this has been my life. It's been a 15-year career. This is everything that I dreamed of. This 
since I was a kid. And to know that a country has supported me so strongly and the people in the country have been so great. The most dominant female bobsleigh pilot. As for Bobsleigh Canada, in a statement to CBC News tonight, it says it abides by its harassment and discrimination policy that has been in place since 2006. Out of respect to all parties involved, we will not be commenting further on this matter until the process has been completed. So I think, Devin, a lot of Canadians might have a hard time processing this uh, uh, about Kaylee. What happens next? Well, Adrian, for as slow as this process has been to this point, it's escalating. So Humphreys mm -hmm. and her legal team have given Bobsleigh Canada one week to release her from the team. Of course, her citizenship is going to be a big issue in all of this, mm -hmm. but not for very long. This Saturday in San Diego, she's marrying an American, and Adrian, in one week tomorrow, she plans on being in Lake Placid with Team USA. Wow, what a turnaround. Okay, Devin, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, let's go to Washington now. Lawmakers have just taken a step towards impeaching Donald Trump, a set of procedures that help them call and aggressively question witnesses. It's just a step, but after tap dancing for months, Paul Hunter explains Democrats have now put impeachment clearly on the agenda. And so it is that congressional investigations into Donald Trump's presidency are set to accelerate. Mr. Chairman, there are 24 ayes and 17 noes. Your ayes have it. The resolution is agreed to. Today's vote by the House Judiciary Committee effectively sets the rules for an examination of the president that could lead to impeachment hearings. Democrats will dive into all things Trump almost immediately. We will begin next week an aggressive series of hearings uh, investigating allegations of corruption, obstruction and abuse of power against the president. Key questions, did Trump in the eyes of lawmakers obstruct justice? Did he wrongly pay off Stormy Daniels? Is he profiting from his own presidency? And what about his campaign's contact with Russia during the 2016 campaign? Depending on its findings, the committee could recommend impeachment hearings to the House of Representatives. We are on our path. Where it takes us is where the we will follow the facts. That's what it is. Republicans, meanwhile, are pushing back hard. You know, I've wanted a long time to be able to say this. Welcome to Fantasy Island. Insisting it's all smoke and mirrors, that Democrats want to look tough, but don't actually want Trump impeached because, according to the polls, neither do most Americans. The Judiciary Committee has become a giant Instagram filter to make you appear that something's happening that's not. Nonetheless, the hearings, with whatever evidence comes forward, whatever witnesses have to say, will bring talk of impeachment to Capitol Hill ever more forcefully. First up next week, Trump's former campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski, who evidently says he's happy to take questions. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Now, Democrats vying to be the one to take on Donald Trump in next year's election debated again tonight. Among the hot topics, health care. Costs are going to go up for giant corporations, but for hardworking families across this country, costs are going to go down, and that's how it should work under Medicare for All in our health care. Only the top 10 contenders were invited to face off in Houston. This is the first time, though, that leading three, Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, and Elizabeth Warren, have all been part of the same debate. Okay, it's still ahead tonight. A double dose of stories about your health. Hundreds are sick with a mysterious and deadly illness linked to vaping. Should governments ban it? Plus, CBD oil marketed as a cure-all, does it do anything? We're back in two minutes. All right, welcome back. Let's go to the Nationals newsroom in Vancouver, where Ian is tracking other stories across Canada tonight. And Adrian, let's begin with some developing news from Kingston, Ontario. Violent attacks this afternoon have left one victim dead, sent others to hospital, and the attacker shot by police. A bystander took video of some of it, which we have edited. 
can get a sense of how quickly things were developing as police responded. They say they found a 22-year-old man assaulting someone with a knife. The man seemed to start chasing others down. A shot was fired, striking him. Word is he also stabbed himself with a knife. He was dead at the scene. Officials say a 40-year-old victim died of his injuries. Several others taken to hospital, but we haven't heard how many or their conditions. Ontario's police watchdog is now looking into all of this. Four children were taken to hospital today at a Montreal elementary school. A student found a can of bear repellent in the schoolyard and then pulled a pin. Besides the four taken to hospital who were vomiting and coughing, 18 students were treated at the school. And an Ottawa city councillor has been accused of asking a job applicant inappropriate questions. A woman has accused Rick Shirelli of asking her if she was willing to go to work not wearing a bra. She alleges that he also showed her photos of employees in revealing outfits. I found the, the entire account very disturbing. Uh, and um, I know that we have a process in place where uh, the individual uh, has gone to the integrity commissioner. If Shirelli is found to have violated the city's code of conduct, he might have to forfeit 90 days salary. There are concerns in the Bahamas tonight about another approaching storm. I'll have more on that in about 20 minutes. Well, police raided homes and offices across Russia today in what was said to be a money laundering investigation. But those homes and offices belong to well-known Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny and his supporters. And as Chris Brown tells us, the raids follow heavy losses by Vladimir Putin's party in recent local elections. The security camera makes it seem like a robbery, but this was a state-sponsored break-in. Get on the floor, screamed the men in masks and military fatigues. Security service personnel surprised opposition activists here and in more than 40 other spots across Russia, including Vladivostok, where they took a chainsaw to get into one office. The target of the raids was the political network of anti-corruption crusader and Putin arch-rival Alexei Navalny. It's obvious that the operation of this magnitude could be authorized only by Vladimir Putin, because United Russia lost a lot of seats, he said. Putin's United Russia suffered significant losses in last weekend's municipal elections, and though Navalny's supporters were disqualified, his call for people to choose anyone except a Kremlin-backed candidate appears to have resonated. The capital was rocked all summer by street protests leading up to the vote, with mass arrests and some protesters thrown in jail for years. Critics accused the government of resorting to Stalin-era tactics to quash dissent. We'll continue our fight against election fraud, vowed an activist today in St. Petersburg. This analyst with close ties to the Kremlin offered up a predictable characterization of Putin's opponents, suggesting Navalny is a traitor and the crackdown is justified. Everybody knows that Alexei Navalny is political agent of United States government, who claims that Russia is enemy of the United States. Pro-Putin commentators always point out how insignificant Navalny is and that the West gives him far too much credit, suggesting he probably is a far greater worry than the Kremlin would ever admit. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. Now, today, interestingly, I had a chance to sit down with Gary Kasparov, Kremlin critic, pro-democracy activist, also happens to be one of the best chess players of all time. His take on the rates today in Russia... Vladimir Putin is running out of moves. There are always games they could play. Uh, they could blame, you know, the fifth column in the country. They could blame enemies outside of the country. But now he's dealing with young population, with just a lot of people that are just in, in their 20s that see no future with Putin. Putin is there for 20 years and uh, they, they, they want to understand so how, to, how they can make their lives. And... Uh, he just, he ran out of options, so that's why it, it hurts to say, but we'll see more and more uh, of, of these kind of aggressive actions from the government. Tell me more about how you see the end game playing out, because if you say that this regime could get tougher and tougher, at least in a domestic sense, what does that look like? I mean, how much worse does this get? I can tell you, the things will be getting worse and worse as long as Putin stays in power. Sooner Putin goes, less blood will be spilled. I don't know the end game, and that's bad news because I don't know how and when it happens. The good news, Putin also doesn't know that. 
So, so Adrian, that was a, it was a really fascinating mm. conversation. We spent a good chunk of time this afternoon, Kasparov oh, no. and I, talking. You know, all sorts of things from Trump to democracy to Russia to Putin to artificial intelligence. A uh, full interview coming in a few weeks' time right here on The National. I'm pretty sure it could fill the entire <laughs> hour. Yeah, probably, yeah. So, still ahead on tonight's National, Rosie is back with the Ad Issue Gang. Two days in, first debate down, one leader missing. The team weighs in. The first leader's debate of the election campaign just wrapped up. McLean's and City TV hosted this one, but Justin Trudeau chose to skip it. So how did the other leaders do, and will tonight make a difference? At issue, back for all your post-debate reaction. Chantal Hébert is in Montreal. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto. Althea Raj here with me in Ottawa tonight. Good to see all of you. Uh, so it was the first time we saw, well, a debate with any of these people, but two of the leaders on stage for the first time ever. Let's just do an overall assessment of, of how, how we think... Uh, what 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 struck out what struck you and who performed well, Chantal? Um, Justin Trudeau in his absence, because I think <laughs> uh, Elizabeth May and Jagmeet Singh uh, were very effective at every turn at arguing the, to Andrew Scheer that he was actually worse than Justin Trudeau. Yes, uh, and, and anyone who was watching would have come away thinking if this is a two-way race. The two leaders who, who are non-conservatives are, are basically saying the devil you know is not as bad as this devil that you don't know. Uh, I think Jagmeet Singh probably helped himself more than the others, possibly mm -hmm. because he was underestimated going in and the, he held his own. I thought it was an interesting debate overall. Uh, I, I, I too had a couple of moments where I thought, is, does Jagmeet Singh want to help the Liberals right now, or the same for Elizabeth May? There were, there were I, I, have a, I have a question on my pad about yeah. the two of them, and it says, what is the game plan? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. A Andrew, what, what did you take away from it? Well, I agree in part. I do think Jagmeet Singh did his cause the most good yes. today, partly because he was, his performance was good. He was, he was focused. He was well briefed. He was competent. And when you're, the knock against you is that you're not fundamentally competent, then... Uh, He's clearly uh, exceeded expectations, as they say. And he also, I think, and I'll disagree a little bit with the previous comments, I think he did make the case more than Elizabeth May did for disaffected liberals as to why they should be looking at the NDP. He was more on point on his critiques of the liberal government in this. Ms. May was her idiosyncratic, authentic self. It will be thrilling, I think, to her existing supporters. I'm not sure it would have expanded her base that much. And I think Andrew, Andrew Scheer, who had the least to gain today, I think did himself some good in the sense of not getting caught up in the fray with the other two candidates with whom he is not really battling for votes and keeping his focus on uh, Justin Trudeau with whom he is battling. Yeah. I mean, even his body language, it was clear he was told not to turn and address either of them and just sort of keep it uh, straight at the camera. Althea. I love it when we kind of all disagree a little bit. Yes, um, me too. <laughs> uh, Andrew Scheer was a little stiff, um, and it will be interesting to see uh, him, I think, get more comfortable um, in the position debating with the other leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, it was clear that his message was really directed at uh, the people who are very frustrated with Justin Trudeau. Uh, he mentioned the Liberal leader more than 20 times, uh, and his message was really focused, you know, us versus the Liberals. Um, it was very interesting to see uh, Mr. Singh and Ms. May debate each other. And I actually would give Elizabeth May the upper hand here. I felt like she dominated the debate. Uh, she took Mr. Singh to task on a number of fronts, whether it was on the Indigenous file when he, she asked him, you know, very pointedly, well, who do you think actually provides these services? Public tendering doesn't mean a public company does it. It means a private company does it. Mm -hmm. uh, or LNG. Um, or the fact that, you know, she said uh, a few times, you know, like, you're like a, a green, but your targets are too low. Um, that being said, I think a lot of people didn't know who Jagmeet Singh was, and mm -hmm. he's a charming fellow, and that came mm -hmm. across. So uh, there was definitely two very different audiences. You yeah. know, Mr. Shear was talking to Canadians who are uh, more concerned about their taxes and money coming into their pockets, and Elizabeth May and Jagmeet Singh were kind of uh, offering Canadians a kind of new nation-building project and big yeah. government programs and dream with us, and, and that was very striking. Yeah, it, it was hard to see, I, I, I think, that... that Trudeau was, you know, severely damaged, though, after that debate. I'm not sure you would all agree. But I, I want to pull out a couple of highlights from the debate. One thing that Andrew Scheer said about uh, balancing budgets, because it, it sounded like something 
that maybe needs further questioning. So I'll, I'll just play what he had to say, and you guys can tell me what you think. We are going to control the rate of growth of government spending. That is how we are going to get back to balanced budgets. Uh -huh. We have seen record levels of spending. We are going to maintain those levels. So you can actually hear Elizabeth May at one point go, ah, because this, of course, is what the liberals in particular are trying to suggest that Andrew Scheer will do, that he will maybe not make cuts, but if you're going to restrict spending, that means that something has to fall by the wayside. Uh, Chantal, did that perk up your ears at all, that comment? A, a bit, but I, I, I would agree with your preface that it may bear more questions uh, mm -hmm. rather than provide a real picture. I have to say that I heard it, but it didn't strike me uh, as a big moment uh, where suddenly uh, it's all revealed. Yeah. Sheer is yeah. more defined uh, yeah. by by what he he came up with. Sure. I have to say, uh, going back to what we just discussed, that. It, Sheer was clearly playing for the clips that you will be playing, mm -hmm. yes. and, and this is one of those. I mean, <laughs> well, I've done, I, there you go. I've done that for him, Andrew. Yeah. Well, res <laughs> restricting the rate of growth of spending that is already at all-time record highs is not what I think most people would call austerity. So no, not I'm not sure I see the aha moment there, to be frank. No, but but can you see how it gets turned into something? I oh well, the, yeah. <laughs> the spin machines everything will be is, trying. Yeah, <laughs> everything gets turned into something. Okay, so not let me. By so, us. Yeah, no, not, not by us. Let me. Let, so let me play a little clip of of what Althea was referring to there, the, the, and what we all speculated about before the debate. And this is the interaction between Singh and May. This was the one sort of um, chippier moment, uh, and it, it's super interesting to look at. So here's what that sounded like. We have a solid position, unlike the Greens, on a woman's right to choose. We have a solid position when it comes That's down to true. national unity. We have a belief that we can't leave <laughs> workers true. behind, and we strongly believe that we should not be putting Mr. Scheer in the prime minister's seat, unlike Ms. May and the Green Party, who believe that's the right choice. Excuse Mr. Scheer, on the question, uh, those, and then... Those so, were absurd so, statements. Uh, uh, Althea, you, you called attention to this. You start, you start off. Yeah, I mean, this was really the, I think, knockout punch that Jagmeet Singh thought he was going to get on Elizabeth May by raising these issues that have been in the media. Uh, the fact that, you know, we had Pierre Nantel, the former NDP MP now running for the Greens, saying that he's a sovereigntist and is amazing. Well, uh, I don't think he is, really. Um, and then the, the abortion issue about whether backbench, uh, well, I guess in this case, they'd be all backbench MPs, but uh, <laughs> Green MPs would be allowed to introduce legislation to restrict a woman's right to choose. Yeah. And she just kind of like laughed it off, uh, mm -hmm. clearly trying to like starve this issue of any oxygen, doesn't want to get into it. Um, but that was really the only contentious moment that we really saw Mr. Singh land uh, against Elizabeth May. Yeah, yeah Andrew, uh, what, Andrew, what did you think of it, that dynamic? They were effective points. They were points on which she's been on her back foot for a week or two now. Uh, the only trouble was it was an hour into the debate when I would guess two thirds of the audience had probably left. So he needed to do it earlier and he needed to do it often, more often and follow it up. That was basically the only time he raised those points. Uh, Rosie, we talked about uh, playing for the clips. I'm sure that the NDP, if they could have picked the clip you were going to play, uh, because Andrew is quite right, it came late uh, after uh, minutes uh, of other debates. But uh, the fact that you're playing that clip and that it will play mm -hmm. means that it wasn't a wasted moment. Yeah. I, yeah, the clip. Uh, For the record, no one's calling me and telling me which clips to choose. <laughs> no, no, no. But I mean, if you were them, you would say mission yes. accomplished. To, yeah, yeah. Okay, to, Andrew. To yeah. me, the most jaw-dropping moment, and, and not a good one for Elizabeth May, was in the segment on Bill 21 when all three of them gave extremely weak answers uh, on what they, they would do about Bill 21, effectively virtually nothing. But Ms. May added that she would uh, help them help religious oh, minorities yeah. in Quebec oh, who yeah. couldn't find jobs because yeah. there's going to be a, there is now a religious hiring bar in the public service, or much of the public service, mm -hmm. that she'd help them find jobs out of the province. And I mean, yeah. all three leaders basically threw religious minorities in Quebec under the bus. She's going to buy them bus tickets. See, that would be the clip I would have taken. If we were choosing clips from this, I would have taken that <laughs> clip. <laughs> Let's go back to Justin Trudeau's absence. So they had that podium there. Uh, everyone pretty much ignored it. A couple times, Jagmeet Singh sort of gestured towards it. Uh, certainly, he came up uh, during the SNC uh, area in particular a couple times on China. But I, I don't know. I, should I be surprised that he was not attacked more, Chantal? It's... I mean, the dynamics of this, there are three people, they are answering questions, they, uh, and the camera shot, you barely saw, if you came in 
after the first five minutes, you probably wouldn't even have noticed that there was an empty podium. Yeah. Mm. I, I think that was inevitable. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, uh, because I think most people who watched it did not want to spend an hour and a half listening to Trudeau bashing anyways. Mm. Uh, a lot of those lines have been heard before. If they're going to vote for someone else, they need to hear the someone else talk about something else. Yeah. Althea, what, what do you, what, how do you think Justin Trudeau came out of this, given that he wasn't there? Well, I think it was a stretch, smart, strategic move for the Liberals uh, not to put him in this debate, though as uh, a journalist and a citizen in this country, I would have liked to see him debate for democracy. I mean, he did run in 2015, telling us how much he uh, would put himself forward in front of the media and in front of the public, and so it's disappointing to see him not there. But I think it's a, a clear front-runner strategy. Uh, instead, he spent the day uh, courting voters in unheld writings, getting one assumes pretty favorable media coverage with, with local media, uh, um, and that may be worth more than the several thousands, hundreds of thousands maybe, who watched this debate um, in, uh, in the GTA, one assumes mostly uh, that we are located in, or CDT, City TV is located mm -hmm. in. Um, uh, it was odd because we did, at the beginning, they mentioned that he wasn't there, but they never showed the empty podium again. Yeah. That yeah. being said, uh, Mr. Wells, the moderator of the debate, kind of brought up points that Mr. Trudeau, probably, if he'd been there, would have made about uh, Brexit, for example. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth May uh, brought up points against Andrew Scheer that probably Justin Trudeau would have done yeah. with regards to China. So in some ways, he didn't even need to be there to defend himself. Some people were doing the job for him. Yeah, about 45 seconds for you, Andrew. I think it, it worked for him to the extent that it starved the event of oxygen. There would be fewer people watching because they want to see a prize fight. Uh, I do think, however, that if the emerging issue around Justin Trudeau is credibility and can you trust him, uh, it doesn't look good when you're not showing up for debates, when you are refusing to allow cabinet confidential, confidential, confidentiality to be waived in an RCMP inquiry. Um, you can put, start to put those pieces together and where these things become salient is when a, in a public mind is when a bunch of separate issues congeal into one issue. Mm. And if, if this adds to that impression of that his credibility is on the line, then that can hurt him even if this particular debate didn't do that much damage. Okay, well, we watched it, so that's good. <laughs> And we tried to sort it out for everybody else, which is what we wanted to do. Thank you all very much for uh, staying up late and watching that with us and for us. Appreciate it. We'll talk again soon, but not too soon. Before we go, be sure to subscribe to At Issue, the podcast edition. Look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. Also, check out a new podcast called Party Lines, Elamin Abdul Mahmoud. And yes, I'm there too. We'll get you election ready every Thursday. New episode out now. And we are back in two minutes with a story for anyone who's ever tried CBD oil for their health. It's been recommended to treat everything from anxiety to cancer, but does it really help? Next. Cannabidiol or CBD is having a moment. It's showing up in all kinds of products and celebrities are all in on the hype. Willie Nelson launched a line of CBD-infused coffee beans. Mandy Moore has talked about using CBD cream for foot pain. Busy Phillips says she carries CBD gummies to ease anxiety. And Kim Kardashian threw a CBD-themed baby shower where guests made their own CBD-infused bath salts and body oils. So she's infusing it with the CBD right now. So is CBD as harmless as it's made out to be? Health reporter Christine Birak looks at what the science says. Pull out what you need. Once daily, Martha Glennie drops a dose of cannabidiol or CBD under her tongue. She says it eases her intense nerve-related back pain. It has not removed the pain 100%. It has made days where I don't have any pain. CBD is a sister compound to THC that can offer health benefits without making people feel high. For roughly $100 a bottle, the oil's being pushed as a harmless cure-all for a long list of conditions, including cancer, anxiety, chronic pain, and opioid addiction. While it does hold promise as a medication, aside from treating epilepsy, this helps their nerve doctors say there are a few guidelines for prescribing it for anything else. Passionate. It's tricky. It is one of the first times, I think, in Canadian history where, you know, a medication has made it to the population without the science actually leading us there. 
A recent review for doctors looked at the medical evidence around CBD and recommended care must be taken when directing patients towards CBD products, noting there's little regulation. Studies have found some bottles contained no CBD at all, and most contain THC as well. And large trials of CBD treatment for epileptic patients showed side effects, ranging from sleepiness and diarrhea to patients developing liver toxicity. Another problem is that cannabidiol can also interact with other drugs that you, you take at the same time. Dr. Gabriella Gobi is studying CBD for sleep disorders at McGill. There's also early research, mostly animal studies, examining it as a treatment for inflammation, anxiety, and even psychotic symptoms. Dr. Gobi has this advice for those looking to give CBD a try. This one must be done with the help of a doctor. You can't just to self-treat yourself with the medical cannabis or cannabidiol. Well, I haven't noticed any side effects doing this dosage. Glennie sought out Clark for help with her back pain. He says most physicians are open-minded about prescribing CBD, but many are eager to see the academic evidence backing it up. Let's figure out what people are using. Let's figure out, you know, what the levels are in their body and what is actually being helped and what isn't. And, and once we get to that place, I don't think it's too far off. The world is looking to Canada over the next five to ten years. For as long as it works, Glennie says she's just happy to be able to do everyday things. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Still ahead, healthy kids turned gravely ill from vaping. Tonight, new calls to ban the addictive products, but first. In case you missed it, this is the newest look of the Hong Kong protest movement. Thousands are converging on malls, on train stations, and to stadiums, belting out a new anthem of sorts, a resistance song called Glory to Hong Kong. There's even a music video with musicians outfitted just like the protesters. The lyrics are a vow not to surrender in the fight against Beijing for democratic freedoms. I think the song gathers people really nicely. They can really show people that their opinion towards the whole movement in Hong Kong. At times, there's also chanting as protesters reiterate their five demands, notably not their uniformed police who show up in force at other demonstrations. But there is pushback. Today, counter-protesters showed up at one mall waving Chinese flags and singing the actual national anthem. Their chants were eventually drowned out. <laughs> Elsewhere, a much more tense meeting of the two sides, and there could be more to come. Police have banned another major rally planned for this weekend. But one of these flash mobs ended with shouts of see you at Victoria Park. That's where it's scheduled to start. Welcome back to our national newsroom in Vancouver. Less than two weeks after being battered by Hurricane Dorian, another storm is headed towards the Bahamas. It's not expected to hit hurricane levels, but still the winds and heavy rainfall that is being forecast would be hitting an area that is still struggling. Officials say 1,300 people are still missing, a much lower number than yesterday's estimate. And almost 150 business leaders in the United States are stepping into a very controversial debate. They're calling for, quote, common sense gun laws. A letter to the U.S. Senate uh, calling for expanded background checks and new ways to prevent access to firearms. The list includes the heads of major tech companies like Uber, Airbnb and Twitter, who call the situation an urgent public health crisis. The National is back in two minutes with an important story about kids' health. Vaping is popular with teens. That, that popularity has been helped along by fruity flavors. Well, tonight, new figures about how many people are sick from it and new calls to ban it. That's next. Teens with collapsed lungs, hundreds of people in the U.S. hospitalized all because of vaping. Now, the exact source has not been identified, but today the CDC announced there are 380 confirmed and probable cases of lung disease linked to e-cigarette use. 
So that has prompted calls to ban thousands of flavors that attract young people. The Trump administration really is considering it. And as Karen Pauls tells us, in Canada, it came up today on the campaign trail. And the raspberry sour. Keith Burns loves the variety. 117 e-juice flavors are manufactured and sold here. He doesn't want them banned until there's proof they're causing respiratory illness. They don't know how people are getting sick. People like 21-year-old Elijah McClure, who went from being a healthy former high school athlete to needing a ventilator and breathing tube to stay alive. He started vaping at 15. The violent retching with the dry heaping and the vomiting, the pain that he was going through really shook me to my core. McClure is just one of those hundreds of cases of lung disease associated with vaping in the U.S. There are six suspected deaths. No single device or product is to blame, although many cases involve marijuana vaping. People are dying with vaping, so we're looking at it very closely. The Trump administration is planning to remove all flavored e-juice from store shelves, the first step in what may become a complete ban of mint, candy, fruit and alcohol flavors. Tobacco flavoring would still be allowed. In Canada, Ottawa recently passed legislation banning the sale of vaping products to anyone under 18 and restricting advertising. Health Canada has also stepped up inspections of vape and convenience stores. The question of a ban came up today on the campaign trail. We'll certainly take a look at that. But our decisions will be made uh, based on evidence. We should be very careful to assess any sort of information that we have. It's hard to get current statistics because all of this is so new, but one study in 2015 in the U.S. found more than 80% of underage teens who started vaping started with flavors like this, packaged to look like candy. Not surprisingly, the vape industry is resisting any talk of banning flavored products. There's a lot of research that says that uh, adult smokers that have stopped smoking by using vaping also use flavors. So I'm not sure that an outright ban on all flavors is the right thing. This e-juice manufacturer agrees. The problem really isn't flavors. The problem is uh, the access that uh, people who shouldn't be using these products have to these products. Keith Burns says a ban on fruity flavors would mean he'd have to find what he wants on the black market. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. Okay, next on The National, a moment from the campaign trail that seemed awfully familiar to one from another liberal Trudeau campaign. We'll explain right after this. This was, like, not a great moment. The official liberal campaign grounded today because of this ugly, long scrape on the underside of its wing. It happened last night. The wound... Self-inflicted, the scrape came when the party's media bus just drove right under the wing. Are you feeling a sense of deja vu? Maybe our moment tonight might explain why. It lasted only a day. Then in came the replacement plane, the branding a little less liberal, but this one at least could take off. Not a great campaign moment, but certainly not the first of its kind. There was that time Michael Ignatieff's bus broke down, I remember that one, and that time Paul Martin's wagon wheel went flat. But there is no comparison. Quite like that time, another bus hit another campaign plane being used by another Trudeau. Cue the archival report. In Manitoba tonight, a bus organizer is looking for a new job. The Liberals weren't too pleased about the way his bus drove into their charter jet moments before takeoff this morning. No one was hurt, but the plane was grounded and a luncheon gathering waiting in Ontario never got to see Trudeau. By the time Pierre Trudeau did get to a mic, he had his political burn ready to go. I felt for a moment when the plane didn't take off how Mr. Clark must feel with his whole campaign, which never took off. <laughs> That's classic Trudeau right there. I was going to say, sometimes it actually works out. I was covering a Quebec election with Jean Charest. He's starting to take off in the polls. He was going to win. 
and his bus went on fire one night. Wow. And so then that was my opening cheesy line, Jean Charest <laughs> is on fire. <laughs> <laughs> um, so nice to see the Anne Medina story, and it makes me think that if Trudeau's son or daughter ends up becoming prime minister in 20 or 30 years, the national, where people will probably be watching on their contact lenses, they're going to play this tape, and they're going to say, remember when four <laughs> people were in boxes together at the end of the show? That was probably the last time probably. a bus hit a plane. <laughs> I was, I was, you stole what I was going to say because to hear Anne Medina's voice mm. is fantastic. I'd love to know what she thought of today. Might, you know, may call her later to find out. But I also can't stop thinking, what, what if social media had been lurking around in that era? The, the memes that would have come out of that day would have been unbelievable. <laughs> now, I have a feeling I'm going to be alone on this one. But, but is it just me or was the most fascinating thing about this most recent case that the bus almost fit exactly under the wing of the plane? Isn't it, isn't yeah, that's just you. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. It did yeah, until thought, it didn't. I thought from a physics think. standpoint, it was kind <laughs> of interesting. Uh, that's the National for this Thursday, September 12th. Have a good, good night. 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 night.